Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. And Greggy, what, what, are you, what are you doing? What do you mean? Why are you playing Journey? Yeah. Did you read the title of the sermon? Yeah. Just a small town. Oh, all right, never mind. Thank you, Rick. All right. Don't stop believing. Hold on to that feeling. One of the things I loved about growing up at a Bible school in the 80s was the conferences that the school hosted because it would be a packed auditorium, 500 people singing and belting out hymns of praise. I love a packed room where everyone is singing like they mean it. And the school would have the choir of all the students in the choir, and then they would perform, and then there would be the, uh, the quartets and the mixed quartets and the male quartets and the choirs and the trios and the solos. And it was all so good. And as a kid, I just loved being part of that, and I so much wanted to do that when I grew up. When I was in middle school, our church started doing special musicals, cantatas for Christmas and Easter. And it wasn't just your regular Sunday morning choir. No, no, this was an elite choir. Mostly it was young 20-year-olds, single, college and career, high school age, all the people that I looked up to. But they also wanted a children's choir to add to that for some numbers and then to add to the fullness of it. So that's when we, us middle schoolers, were recruited, uh, you know, where our voices hadn't changed yet. So we were able to still do that part. And I was so excited to be part of all of that. I love choir, the big productions. I love singing. And then on top of that, you think about it, it was being around all the cool people, you know, the high schoolers, the college and career, you know, the cute girls were in this. So uh, it's everything I wanted to be a part of. Uh, when I was uh, growing up, the college and career age were actually the people that would lead in Awana and lead in youth group, and uh, they were the active, athletic, exciting people, and they were actively serving and pouring us into, into us kids at church. And uh, it's interesting, and I think about our, our church and, the, and the, the kids I grew up in, in this little country church and. Nowheresville, New Brunswick, Canada. There's five of us that all came out of there that are pastors today in, in that area and around the world. So you need to think about that. 20-year-olds, you have an influence that you can really pour into young ones that can impact them from all of their lives. So anyways, I was, I was in the choir, and uh, like I said, many of my friends were in the choir, the high school kids that were cool and, and the cute girls. And during one of the practice... One of the 20-something dudes made the comment in front of everyone that I sing flat, off-key, and loud, which is all true. <laughs> all of that were facts. I love singing. I wasn't a very good singer. I didn't sing on tune. I didn't realize how bad I was, though, until he pointed it out in front of everyone. And then I just felt embarrassed and sad that yet again... As was the case, like everything else in my life that I really loved and wanted to do, I wasn't good at it. See, back in the 80s, nobody spared your feelings. Nobody cared about your dreams. If you weren't good at something, they just bluntly told you or cut you. No, you can't play. You suck. Get out of here, kid. You asked a girl out and she said, ew, and you knew exactly what people thought of you. So what's a young fella to do? Crawl into a hole and die? Never try anything you love? Well, for me, I just kept doing things I loved, even if people thought I was terrible at it. I wasn't doing it for them, I was doing it for me. So I stuffed my little hurt feelings and I just kept right on singing loud, flat, and out of tune. But two things happened when I got to high school. Number one, I hit puberty and my voice changed. Don't know if I got any better, but you know, change is as good as a rest, so it was different. And then second of all, I got my license and then I was just able to drive myself everywhere. And what I would do whenever I drive 
is I crank the radio up and I would try to mimic the singers on the radio. I'd be doing Tears for Fears, and George Michaels, and Def Leppard, and Bon Jovi, you know, singing as loud as I want, trying to be the lead singer on my own little car karaoke. And with all that practice and trying to imitate those guys, I actually learned to hear the melodies and for the most part, stay on tune. And so I could learn to hit the notes. But try as I might, some guys, like Journey, I could never sound like Steve Perry. Second line of that song, just a small town girl living it up. <laughs> Can't do it. Steve just lets you know right up front, I'm awesome and you're not, so don't cover my song. But the fun thing about singing all the time is I learned the words to hundreds and hundreds of songs. I got them all memorized. And that song right there, Don't Stop Believing, that's always resonated with me. Kind of a, an anthem for a loser kid like me. Doesn't matter if everyone thinks you suck and you're ugly. Don't stop believing. Hold on to that. I will, Steve. I will hold on to that feeling. It's kind of weird. I went to college. And during chapel, we were doing, you know, singing hymns. And I was doing my usual Rob singing. And uh, someone turned around and said to me, you should sign up for choir. And I was like, what you talking about? <laughs> First time in my life, people told me I should sing in public. And then my first church that I was youth pastor in, the pastor came up to me and he volunteered me. He said, you're going to be part of this new praise team. We're going to do new praise songs in church and you're going to lead singing. And I was like, you want me to lead singing in front of everyone? And he said, yes, we need people who sing out like they mean it. And I said, well, that's what I can do. That is my specialty. These are my silly stories. And maybe you hear them and say, well, you know, it sounds like you were a really dopey kid, McNutt. And I was. I have lots of insecurities coming out of my childhood, but I did pick up on a few things that have served me well. And one of them is, don't stop believing. Life will knock you down every day. Someone will make you feel small and worthless, but you got to keep trying. You got to keep going so this is what I want to encourage you with today. Don't stop believing. Oh, you're just quoting a cheesy 80s song. Well, maybe I am, but that cheesy 80s song resonates with people from all times. Even the folks back in 67 AD, the author of Hebrews is saying the exact same thing. Chapter 3, verse 12. Here we go. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another, encourage one another, don't stop believing, day after day, as long as it's still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast to the beginning of our assurance firm until the end, while it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart, as when they provoked me for who provoked him when they had heard indeed did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses and with whom was he angry for 40 years was it not those who sinned whose bodies fell in the wilderness and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest but to those who were disobedient so we see that they were not able to enter able to enter because of unbelief. Of course, the author of Hebrews is not trying to convince people to not quit choir and not give up on their dreams. No, it's more important things at stake here in the book of Hebrews. It's not talking about don't stop believing in yourself. Don't stop believing in Jesus. He says here in verse number 12, take care. The Greek word is blepo. Uh, it, it would be better translated, like probably your King James Version says, watch out. When someone's leaving after your house after a visit. You say, well, you know, good to see you. Take care. Bye-bye. That does not convey the same message as when someone says, watch out. This is a more intense warning. 
The author just reminded the audience of the famous generation of Israelites who followed Moses out of Egypt, but because of their unbelief, died in the wilderness, never making it to the place of rest. And then we spent a good deal of time two weeks ago defining rest and all of the different usages of it. The ultimate rest in Scripture is eternal life, a heavenly home or paradise. That's the rest we are all needing and wanting to enter into. Verse 12 says, watch out. And then he says, brethren, remember chapter 3, verse 1, the first of this chapter. Therefore, holy brethren, the audience is Christians. Christians are being warned to watch out that there's not be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. So this is where I free associated to get to that long intro, including Ricky, you know, unbelieving heart, don't stop believing. But notice the other word that is modifying heart, not just unbelief, what else? Evil. Poine Ross is the Greek word. If used to describe your physical body, it, it could be translated diseased or blind. In the ethical sense, wicked, opposite of good, bad or evil. And that is why many people in our culture, in our day and age, do not like the Bible, the absolutes, the non-negotiable nature of God. God doesn't offer alternatives or a variety of options or flavors. So often things are black or white, right or wrong, good or evil. Believing in Jesus, good. Unbelief, no. Evil. That's not a version of Christianity that people in 2022 want to join. So folks came up with progressive Christianity. That's the big buzzword for the last 10 years, making progress. If you're making progress, it means something's incomplete, changes are needed, it's okay, not great, but we're working on it. It's getting better, it's progressing. Progressive Christianity? How is Christianity progressing? Well, in our woke era, Progressive Christianity means you don't hold on to anything that people might find offensive. So the teaching of Paul that only men can be elders and pastors, well, that offends half the demographic. That offends all the women. So, you know, they might want the job and they feel called. Well, we got to get rid of that. We don't want to offend people. Immorality, you know, sleeping around, fornication, using pornography, homosexuality, LGBTQ, all that. That's not sin. Everybody's into that. Abortion, ooh, don't, that's not sin. And Jesus, he's not the only way to God. We, we can't tell people of other faiths that they're wrong. No, we've progressed beyond that, which means progressive Christianity doesn't believe the words of Jesus, which means it's, well, it's really not Christianity now, is it? Because a Christian is someone who believes in Jesus, and according to Hebrews, holds on to his word. But if you progress to rejecting Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, then you've stopped believing. Well, actually, you haven't progressed. You've regressed back into sin and an evil, unbelieving heart, which Hebrews concludes means you have fallen away from the living God. You know, there's a lot of people like me who, who grew up in church and, you know, really like the, the singing and the fun things, and being part of the family and the community, you know, you're all going to church, you got these traditions, especially Christmas, you know, you know people like the traditions of, of, uh, of, of church in those times, uh, you know, people like being on the softball team, and you know, the work projects of helping people out in the community, I like bringing my kids to BBS, and, and all the fun kiddo things, you know, that, that sounds pretty cool, we're going to have bouncy houses and barbecue, people like that stuff about church community, but I just don't want the Bible telling me what to think and feel and believe. Well, that is the biblical definition of evil. Sin, the Greek word, hamartio, literally means missing the mark. There is this specific 
target, stated goal, the command that God has spoken, and you have missed it. You ignored it. You disobeyed it. That is the definition of sin, unrighteousness. That is evil. Well, oh, it's a strong word. Because we think evil, we think, you know, Hitler. It's something really offensive, you know, like a rapist or a serial killer. That's evil. We don't think of the little old new agey lady who's doing some yoga as evil. You know, she, she's not doing a black mask, for goodness sake. I mean, she's, she's not into Jesus, but she's cool and I like her. Well, yeah, I do too, but scripture says that's an evil Unbelieving heart. Well, my buddies that I play ball with, you know, they're a little crass. They don't believe in Jesus, but you know, they're good people. Get them to help me move. Yeah, okay. They're cool, but they have an evil, unbelieving heart. See, God doesn't line everybody up at the great white throne judgment and say, well, you know, you weren't Hitler. <laughs> you weren't a serial killer. You know, you were a cool guy and your neighbors liked you. So, you know, come on, get in here. Yeah, knucklehead. Ah, no, if we are unbelieving, we're judged as evil and we're going to hell. See, secular humanists teach us that people are inherently good. And most people in our society believe that. That everyone's, yeah, we're all good people. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We all have sinned. That means we all are evil. Some of you got it. John Murdoch and a few other people, but you're all going to say it. We all are evil. evil. Yeah, that's the biblical theology behind it. We're all evil, even religious people. Religion is not the same as believing in Jesus. You know that, right? Religion is not the same as believing in Jesus. Religion often can bring you farther away from God as opposed to close to God. The Hebrews, who he's talking to, they were deeply, deeply religious. They were monotheistic, believing there was only one God. Well, that's not very progressive of them now, is it? No question, God was a huge part of their culture and their traditions, and they never questioned his existence or his importance. But those attitudes and feelings do not equal believing. That was the whole point of revisiting the story of the generation who followed Moses out of Egypt when it came time to get into the land that God was going to give them. They said, ah, that's a big no for me. <laughs> you can't do that, God. You're not that strong. I don't believe this is possible. God's word says Jesus is the new covenant. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus fulfills the law and he is the once for all sacrifice for sin. I don't think so. I, I think I'll just keep taking the family to the temple and sacrifice sheep. That is unbelief. That's an evil, unbelieving heart. Hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, verse number 13. Encourage one another day after day, as long as you still call today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Three times this idea of hardening has been repeated in this chapter. Twice it's been the quoting of Psalms 95, verse number 8, Do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me in the day of trial in the wilderness. And then he repeats that in verse 15. Today, here, you hear my voice, Don't harden your hearts as when they provoked me. And then here in verse number 13, None of you who are hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now, the Greek word here, skeleruno, means obstinate, stubborn. Stubborn as a mule. Can a mule move? Nobody knows. Yes, they have the ability to move. They just don't. They don't want to. When we say harden, it implies that at one time this thing was soft and pliable, movable, like paint, right? It's liquid. And you can apply paint to anything and everything. You could spray it on, slap it on all kinds of surfaces. But once it hardens, it's stuck. It's done. Someone spilled a gallon of paint in our, uh, on our lane down a crab pot. They dropped the bucket and then they drove their car through it. So now we got this nice light blue track going all around the blacktop. 
on the lane. And then it dried and hardened. Now, everyone can see the mistake, and everyone says, oh, no, the paint wasn't supposed to go on the blacktop. It was supposed to go in the house, on the wall, inside. But there's no changing it now. It's there to stay. This is what happens to many people. They make up their mind about something, and now they will not listen, and they will not talk, and they will not debate. They have... I'm, I'm acting that out, so I was kind of hoping you'd say it hardens the warning here is these folks are hardened in the deceitfulness of sin the deceitfulness of sin what does that phrase imply sin lies to us people have information that they're using to base their decisions of what to believe and what not to believe but the information is false but they believe the false information. So now they are deceived. Evolution is proven science. The science is settled. Don't you love that phrase? The science is settled. Well, that's a lie. But millions of people believe and are deceived. I get to decide for myself what is good for me. And nobody can tell me what to not feel. My feelings are what's most important. Aren't they? That's a lie, but many people are deceived by that. God loves people so much, he would never judge or reject anyone. It's a lie, but millions of people are deceived by it. If you don't hold fast to what God is telling you to believe, you have an evil, unbelieving heart. But if we are partakers of Christ... If we hold fast, verse 14, we have become partakers of Christ, conditional covenant, uh, conditional clause, if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, firm until the end. The beginning of our assurance, firm until the end. That's another way of saying, don't stop believing. Assurance, the Greek word hypostasis, means setting or placing under Firm, like a foundation, rooted, grounded. Interesting because in verse 13, we have the idea of hardened in sin, which is not a good thing. But then we have here, hypostasis, firm foundation, assurance. And that's a good thing. So my observation there is it's okay to be firm and uncompromising when you're right. And the problem we're seeing is people are hardened and uncompromising in the deceitfulness of sin. Meanwhile, Christianity is not firm. It's progressing, regressing into unbelief. So we need to be firm, foundational, non-negotiable on the stuff that God says. And some people are not holding on to that. The calling of Jesus is come Follow me. Verse 14, we are partakers of him. We're getting on his team. He's not getting on our team. Do you understand the difference of that? Back when I coached soccer, some of the boys had played a lot and they were very talented. Some of them were. Others were not so talented, but they wanted to be on the team. So they showed up and they worked hard and their effort would compensate for their lack of talent. Some kids never really got that good and they didn't crack the lineup, but they were, you know, happy with a jersey and sitting on the bench and they would do as they're told and there weren't any hassle. The most challenging player to coach was the kid who was talented but didn't want to work hard and didn't want to work as a team. They thought that being on the team was getting what they wanted. You know, I want to play the position I want to play and I want to play the way I want to play. And uh, they, they would never give the effort that was needed. So for those kind of kids, often... Benching them was the only way to get the point across. You know, you're going to do it the right way or you just won't play. But that was kind of hard to do when you only got a limited number of talented people. And, you know, if you bench this kid, you're probably not going to win. But, you know, it seems like you're going to lose if you play him anyway. So you got to, you got to try to get the point across. But sometimes that didn't even work. And the kid would get mad and just quit. And they storm. One time we had one kid actually do that. He took his uniform on, stomped on it, and stormed off in the middle of the game. And those are the kind of players that I have a lot of if-only stories about. 
If only that kid would have cooperated, we would have had a chance to win a championship. If only that kid would have worked with his teammates. If only he would have played harder. If only he wouldn't have quit. And, uh, you know, that kid that did that, he, uh, he admitted to me by the end of the year, he said, you know, I, I was really stupid. <laughs> I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. And I forgave him. But we didn't get the year back. The season was over and the opportunity was forfeited, so it was a tough lesson to learn. Lots of people are approaching God in this manner. God, give me what I, what I want or else I'm not going to believe in you. It's not Jesus wants to hang out with you and be cool with what we're doing. No, we have to choose. People want God to be cool with accepting and tolerant of what they want to do. That's not the invitation. That's not how things work. He's not partaking of your things. You are to become a partaker of what he's offering. He's calling us to be on his team. Well, what's he offering, Pastor Rob? Earthly sufferings. Service. Sacrificing yourself. Yielded obedience. That's what we're supposed to partake in. And eternal rest. Inheritance in a heavenly home. Verse, chapter 3, verse number 1, the way the chapter started, we are partakers of a heavenly calling, not an earthly calling. We want the earthly calling. He's calling us to something higher, a heavenly calling. God's not going to agree to partake in your deceitfulness of sin. He's not going to go along with your man-made religion or your vain philosophies. Verse number 14, we become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance, firm to the end. And then he quotes Psalms 95 the third time, warning about the hardening of hearts. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart as when they provoked me. So that's the third time he's repeated that statement. Chances are when you hear some author say something three times, that's for emphasis. He really wants to drive that point home. He doesn't want you to miss it. If you hear his word, if you hear his voice, but you have an unbelieving heart, that will provoke him. That's the point. Three times. It will provoke him. And then he points to uh, examples of that. Number one reason why you don't stop believing is it provokes God to wrath. And then three questions he asked the audience, and they know the answer because this is their heritage. You know, he said, who provoked them? Who provoked God? Said, well, those who followed the, the nation that followed Moses in the wilderness. Who was he angry with for 40 years? Those same guys. They sinned and they died in the wilderness. Verse 18, who did he swear they won't enter his rest? Those who were disobedient. So, we don't want to be disobedient and not enter God's rest. Don't stop believing. Tom Weaver's mom passed away from blood cancer. And we went up to Pennsylvania for the funeral yesterday. Tom said that type can be hereditary. And uh, he's now got to get tested. So that's kind of scary for Tom and Michelle. Now maybe he might have that, you know, literally inherited that. Michelle found out last week, as Tom's mom passed away, Michelle found out that her dad has stomach cancer. And... Uh, he, it's inoperable, and it's in his lymph nodes now, and uh, they're going to do, they started chemo, like they found out Monday, and they started chemo Wednesday on that, and uh, those are hard things to deal with. In the midst of all that they're trying to do, and they're still doing their ministry to help save marriages and point people to Jesus, you know, come on, God, we're trying to build your kingdom. How come we have to deal with all this cancer and pain in our families? Some of us are dealing with Crazy kids who've walked away from God. You know, God, we were faithful to, to raise our kids to know you. Why are they walking away? Why is this causing us so much pain? And why aren't you calling them back? Sometimes things get really hard in life. I told you about how God had provided uh, my little family with housing while we were up at seminary in exchange for me coaching the college basketball team. The housing was an answer to prayer. Thank you, Jesus. We got a place to live. Don't have to live with my in-laws, all that. Never mind, another story. But I got to tell you, this team was not a blessing. It was quite possibly the worst college basketball team in all of America. 
2005-2006 award for worst college basketball team in all of America, right here. I'm sure I would have won that title. We lack talent. We really only had one legitimate starter in the starting lineup to begin with, of the five guys that we put out there on the floor. Uh, some of the better players, they didn't have any work ethic. They wouldn't practice hard. And there was always somebody missing practice for whatever reason. They couldn't make it. And then halfway through the year, two of those crappy starters quit. They were the best I had, and they quit. So it was very discouraging. I had coached high school sports. I'd always had winning records. I kind of prided myself in being a good coach. But I was coaching the worst college basketball team in America. And I was right back to middle school self thinking, is it me? Do I suck this bad at coaching? I was so discouraged. I always loved basketball, loved coaching, and I just, ah, I don't want to quit. I want to even go. This isn't worth my time. So I had to sit myself down, and I had to say, it doesn't matter if this team is trash. It doesn't matter if we lose every game this year. And we might have won one or two. That was about it. It doesn't matter who quits this team or if anybody doesn't show up for practice, I will not quit because the Lord gave me this job to provide for my family and I believe he wants me to be in seminary and this is meeting our needs and I believe things will get better even if we don't win a game. There's a reason for this and I will not quit. At some point, things are going to be really challenging in your life. And I kind of think America is going to see some really challenging times coming our way. People are depressed and they're anxious and they're angry. And so many people are losing faith. What is it? What is the hardship? What is the lie that the enemy is telling you that is convincing you to quit on your faith? Deceiving you that you can't trust in God. You can't tr trust in his word. Jesus is not worth it. This is the biggest mistake you'll ever make. The biggest lie you'll ever believe. If you fall away from God. If you let go of faith in Jesus. If you stop believing. So that's why we titled it. Don't stop believing. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this challenging word. Mm, a lot of Hebrews is, is kind of edgy. It's right in our face, calling us evil and being uncompromising about how we live and believe. But we need to hear it, Lord. We need to hear it because we know we're coming into this time when there's a falling away and, and a great deception and people are deceived by, by their sin and their, they think that that is right and you are wrong and your word is wrong and Jesus and we're progressing, regressing away from you. And it is going to have so many people miss out on eternity. And uh, we don't want that. We don't want anybody here. So Holy Spirit, if, if this was at all convicting, may you just really press upon someone's heart here today. You know, you need Jesus. You need to believe. Don't be deceived. Don't be hardened. Think about what he can do, what he has done, what he's promising. Help folks to make the right choice and to be soft into their hearts, to be open. And then help us to be firm and uncompromising with what your word says. And the, the temptation is for everyone to just let go. May we, each and every one here, be firm to trust in you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.